Welcome everybody to conversation nine in our homecoming Sunday conversation series. My name is Matt Reichert. I'm the director of outreach and engagement at GIA publications. Um, joining me today is Kate Williams. Michael Silhavy and Wendy Silhavy, we are happy to be back after our conversation part one last Friday talking through these guidelines. Um, we're going we're gonna to really just jump back into the conversation. We sort of took a four-day intermission from our first conversation on Friday. Uh, I posted in the comments the link to the FDLC guidelines that we'll be discussing. If you weren't able to catch part one on the GIA Facebook page or the GIA YouTube channel, you can find the recordings of all of our conversations in our series, so you can go back and take a look at that. We specifically were talking through page nine, um, strategies for music ministry and ideas for approaching music ministry as we reopen. So that's all in part one. We can get into some of that today, um, but you can view our conversation about that there. For today, I'm going to share my screen here with everyone. We are going to jump in with, uh, for part two here on page 10, and specifically here on page 10, in the guidelines, this is where the FDLC is going through all of the different parts of a Eucharistic liturgy. So we want to talk through uh, different bullet points here, talk about how some places are doing it, other ideas that you might consider. As we're discussing these, of course, please offer your questions. We'll answer as many questions as we can um, through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have ideas or suggestions for how you are doing things in your community, please continue to add those in the chat. Uh, this, again, is really um, meant to be this idea round table, the way that we can uh, help each other out by letting each other know the ideas that we have or the things that we are, are starting with. So, Let's take a look at the introductory rights. Um, Wendy, I, I know that you are awfully familiar with the extensive guidelines that have been issued by the Archdiocese of Chicago. Those are available online for people to view. I know the Archdiocese of Baltimore has a 36 page document. Um, plenty of places have a, a very exhaustive uh, recommendations for reopening. Um, do you wanna maybe start us off here looking at introductory rights? What are some of the things you're hearing, some of the things you're seeing places consider uh, um, in this category. Yeah, I think, uh, and just as an aside, on the FDLC website, along with these guidelines, you'll find uh, directives that are being issued by uh, many different dioceses throughout the country. So I think it's a great place to go to uh, see ideas. And again, we, we say every 30 seconds, you need to look at your own local or diocesan directives. It's, it varies widely at this point across the country. So uh, as we offer things, we're offering things that are, you know, I think maybe general interest, but those questions and answers that you pop up are really helpful to help us shape how we talk about these things. So I think uh, here in Chicago, we are in uh, what we're calling phase one, which would start Saturday for those that are ready and certified. And that would be weddings, funerals, baptisms, uh, assemblies of 10 or under, uh, private confessions, sacrament of reconciliation, and then possibly just a bit down the line, private prayer and adoration. So we haven't moved into public masses yet, but I know many parts of the country have. So as we look at the introductory rites, I think you really need to re-examine how a procession would look. In most places, uh, social distancing is crucial, and that means six feet away from anyone at any point. So if you have a narrow aisle in your church, you're not gonna wanna have a procession up your center aisle. You're gonna wanna have ministers coming in from the side, from the, from the sacrifice. Um, when we think about uh, singing, especially maybe some of those presider parts, um, right now in Chicago, we're saying anyone who is singing needs to be 10 to 12 feet away from anybody else in the building. So that means if a presider is with a deacon or a server, um, that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, the same thing for singing. In many parts of the country at this point, congregational singing is not allowed. We're still accumulating research on aerosol spray, and um, there's many unknowns here. So I think it's really important for us to err on the side of caution. Perhaps that opening song is not our typical robust opening song, but it's an antiphon with verses, uh, or it's instrumental music. I know that we're going off the page of what our gathering song is, but it's, it's temporary. Again, that idea of progressive solemnity that we're at a place where we're, we're existing, not fully expressing our liturgical richness. So I think whatever we do, safety needs to be first. Same thing goes for the Gloria. This would be probably the ideal time to do a refrain Gloria. 
so that the assembly is singing uh, a small a small portion of the glory and the cantor is offering the bulk of the prayer. Um, or the Gloria can be recited. We know that's always an option. So again, this isn't forever, but this is as we initially open up our churches. As we've already seen, some churches have opened and have already needed to close again. Here in Chicago, we say that if uh, there's a documented case of COVID amongst a participant, we close the churches for 24 hours, we thoroughly sanitize. So rather than opening and closing, we're trying everything we can do to be safe as we re-enter our church buildings. You know this this first um, this first bullet point that's here, and, and I mean, thank you, thank you for that, because that, like that's there are so many layers, of course, and that's a good way to sort of re-steep ourselves into these questions. That first bullet point about processions, you know, reminds me that um, there are some places that have issued um, sort of guidance, very thorough guidance, in terms of how how do you think about capacity and how do you mathematically and physically mark out your space? And I think oftentimes, of course, we're thinking about seating between um, families or individuals in pews, obviously, but also then we have to in, take into account all of the other movement. So if I'm, if I'm considering, you know, six feet in front of me, six feet behind me, am I, and six feet to the side in the pew, am I also considering six feet from the middle of the aisle, you know, for processions, both for communion or for the presider, if that's, again, what, what's going to be happening, um, really thinking through that plan for how do you map out your space. Uh, Michael, I, at your parish, do, have, have you decided yet, or have you talked about just how to think about or conceive of your space and how to mark things out or um, just how to approach that, that physical road mapping? Yeah, I think we were one of those uh, parishes that Wendy was hinting at about. Uh, it's, it's a tiny church. We only seat about 320. We literally only have 10 pews on the side and 12 pews in the middle section. And uh, our, our aisles may be three or four feet apart. So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for us uh, to do this. Um, but uh, luckily, we've, we've got a map. So, you know, that's one thing you do. Create a map of your space if you don't have that already. And then do this map to scale, unlike a mass for First Communion, which is usually not to scale. Get this mass to scale and then literally begin to plot it out that way. Last episode, we also talked about the challenge is gonna be, it's not good enough just to have dots on the pews every six feet apart, because there's family units that get and maybe need to sit together. So it's not like we can just say 68 people, you each get a dot. Um, the ushers are gonna have to be trained in knowing how to seat groups of people and what that means for placing the next person uh, distant from them. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. And I think, you know, as you're one of the other things we talked about in the previous uh, conversation from last Friday, in addition to the need to train how to seat, um, how to be familiar with the, the map, how to even even how to, um, I think, Wendy, last time you talked about this, how do you train ushers to um, politely but firmly also be able to correct people who are doing something <laughs> incorrect, right? Um, we need to do that, but also are there ways that we can, um, you know, through our own arrangement of space, placement of things, suggest where people should or should not sit? We've all seen the, the blue tape, you know, the pictures of the blue tape or roping off pews, which is great. Um, people asked last time, how do you distribute worship aids? Well, you could also have them in place to indicate this is where you do sit, right? There are a variety of ways that um, we'll need a little bit of everything, I think, to, to be as, as clear as possible. And, and speaking of training, you know, that fourth bullet point under introductory rights um, suggests, again, you know, placing a stand so you don't have to have a server hold the missile, um, which is great. If you're going to continue to use servers, how are the other ways that we're training them or the, the deacon too? Uh, how, do we, how do we train them to understand what they should or should not do, what those processes are? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of layers here. Everyone who's assisting is going to need some sort of training or formation, and I don't know if we've all thought through that. If, if any of you participating and listening have ideas, again, please put them in the, the, the chat feature. Um, have, have any of you, Kate, Michael, Wendy, um, any ideas strike you or anything you've heard of in terms of how places might be approaching um, training of liturgical ministers? 
Well, I'm thinking I really love last week Wendy's encouragement to use this as um, a time to really educate about the reason why our worship looks and feels and, and, and sounds the way that it does. And so when it comes to thinking about the introductory, right, particularly the gathering, I believe this is, um, you know, I got this from Gabe Huck from that book, Liturgy with Style and Grace from LTP. But the gathering, right, is much more than just the ministers walking down the, the, um, the, the aisle, right? The gathering, right, starts when you get up that morning and you dress yourself with your Sunday best or you, you know, put your, um, you put your grandmother's jewelry on or however you present yourself to go to mass. It, it, it's a part of the driving to the church or the walking to church or biking to church. And, you know, is there a way that just for this time, um, you can put a little bit more focus on helping our uh, parishioners to see the value in that larger picture of what it means to gather and maybe even suggesting because in a lot of places that aren't allowed to sing in in the church building but maybe there's a there, there's an opening song we can sing in our car or on the walk on the way over or even just humming to ourselves on the way over that could at least put us in this space of this is all in the act of gathering together yeah and you know i again i'm just going to draw attention to our chicago guidelines because Chicago worked with a company that does um, uh, safety and um, uh, safety procedures in hospitals. And so they helped us develop our guidelines. So I think they're pretty uh, thorough and um, they're pretty neutral as far as, you know, you could be outside of Chicago and these would still be a benefit. So if you go to our Archdiocesan website, it's archchicago.org and um, just go to COVID resources. And then there's tons of things under there, opening plans and, um, We've got videos and webinars, all kinds of things that might be helpful as you develop your own parish or diocese plan. Yeah, um, a, a couple of things just real quickly from the, the chat. Um, Joanna points out rightly that ushers are definitely gonna have to deal with those folks who insist on sitting on the end of the pew. Absolutely, we know it's going to happen, so might as well anticipate it and begin to prepare in your training. Laura's community is going to hold Zoom minister training which is a great idea. And, and also, you know, to, to I think what you were referring, Kate, especially referencing Wendy, that this is a chance to reframe, to re-catechize, to reform people and to bring people together, you know, to get that group of people together through Zoom to reconnect is also important. And says that they are going to begin on Pentecost. They have their seating map ready. Their presider is not going to process, but is going to come from the back of the room behind the sanctuary. And they're also opting to not have servers. Again, another thing to think about. I, I would encourage too for any of the, um, as you're thinking about reopening, for any of the ministries that you might not be using or not, may not be using fully, what are ways to keep those individuals engaged? We see a lot of places talking about my choir can't sing together, but how can I keep us connected and formed and fed by our, our presence with one another? What can you do for servers or for electors or for other people that you might not have serving in their normal way during this time? Can you still keep people connected? Can you still keep people formed? Um, Ken says that they will have a stand with the Roman Missal by the presider's chair. Also, no servers at, at this time. Um, so a few, few other ideas there. Can I throw one word here? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the point two, I think let's use this as a launching point for throughout the mass, other options available. This would not be the time to trot out the confidior to see if people can do it from memory <laughs> uh, because they're not gonna have a worship aid or a hymnal. And what's more perfect than a call and response, Lord have mercy or Kyrie. So we, we're gonna keep coming back to this point when we're talking about how to do the creed, perhaps in question and answer form rather than reciting it. Uh, could Eucharistic acclamations or other music. So um, we just need to keep that principle in mind. The simplest option perhaps needs to be the best right now. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's great. I'm, I'm thank, I'm, that's a, a good reminder. And I think, again, goes back to the way that these guidelines are formed to begin with, which is that there are certain guiding general principles that inform all of this. And I think as, as you're coming up uh, with what your parish is going to do in each of these areas, remember to be anchored in guiding principles like that. Remember the point at from which people are approaching this and always go back to that. Um, 
looking at liturgy of the word, let's let's start with with this because um, I know we've talked about this in in different ways. Um, but you know that first bullet point, the introduction to lecture of the mass, calls for two distinct readers to proclaim the Sunday readings. How might this be temporarily reimagined? Where do readers sit? How do they approach the ambo, etc.? Um, Reactions, ideas to this, and how to utilize readers or lectors in terms of these um, first masses back? You know, I think one thing to keep in mind, too, is the importance of um, cleaning and sanitation. And we know that there are two different things. Cleaning is, you know, cleaning off surface dirt that contains various elements of mm -hmm. biological material. <laughs> and sanitation is actively killing the biological material. So, um, you know, think about in terms of a microphone. Um, how are you going to sanitize that microphone in between uses? You probably want to make sure that the microphone is set to a place that can be used by everybody. You know how everyone reaches out and touches in the dust? Do that right now. Um, so I think the lectors, um, if the cantors at the AMBO, uh, you know, just really need to be aware of, of some of those issues. The same thing with a book. How are we going to put the readings out so that we eliminate touch on, on a book? Um, you know, so for each for each community, I think you need to think through all those ideas. And then I think probably one of the hardest things I've seen so far is we're pretty used to when we go to grocery stores and whatnot, staying like six feet behind the cart in front of us. And um, you know, what's in front of us, it's pretty easy to maintain six foot distance. We also have to be thinking to the sides and to the rear of us. So two lectures walking up, you know, right next to each other, um, you know, and passing really close together is going to be a problem with the six foot distancing. So I think, um, you know, for lack of a better word, choreography is gonna be really, really important. So, and just um, here in Chicago, I keep going back to that because here I am, but um, our recommendation is that everyone keep a mask on except for a moment of active um, proclamation. So the lecturer would go up with the mask, pull the mask down, maybe even on one ear. I mean, now's not a time to look your best at the lectern. Um, proclaim the reading, put it back and then go. I mean. Anything we can do to uh, minimize risk, I think, is our number one concern at this point. Yeah. Uh, Mary has in the comments that um, their pastor is allowing the cantor to read the psalm from the cantor stand, which, again, I, uh, you know, this goes back to one of the other things we talked about on Friday, that there might be things we need to adjust to our typical practice in order to accommodate some of these distancing um, rules, the sanitation you were talking about. Uh, this morning, as I was doing a couple of things on Facebook, I caught the beginning of um, this morning's mass from the cathedral in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, our friend Joe Bazuris was at the piano and Anna Betancourt was the cantor. And one of the things I noticed about Again, they're, they're using a microphone per person, right? So again, the psalm from the canter stand, as opposed to from the ambo. Um, so what that does is it provides, you know, one person is using the microphone to prevent the cross um, contamination. But similar to what we talked about last week too, what it meant is that there's someone always on a microphone responding to all of the responses. And that was also a great byproduct really of this shift, because then if I'm watching live stream, I'm hearing other voices, right? So again, there are, as we shift some of this, it might prevent or present other realities or other opportunities with the way we're live streaming or, or approaching some of these things, right? Um, let's take a look at uh, the third bullet point and the fifth, uh, the last bullet point here, the fifth one, under Liturgy of the Word, which has to do with um, considerations for preparing the homily and writing universal prayer. Um, and, and, you know, far be it for me to give um, pointers on, on writing universal prayers or, or coming up with a homily pointers. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, I'm wondering, you know, Kate, Michael, do you have recommendations for um, either approaches or resources that could be helpful as we're looking to write those universal prayers or, um, or other resources to point back to as we're, we're uh, developing our homilies? Well, I think uh, one thing maybe to do would be just to uh, maintain that list or create a list uh, if one of the petitions, uh, intercessions, perhaps each week could make reference to the current situation. Perhaps it's uh, for local business owners, for, um, uh, for health care providers, you know, etc. Matt Brophy, who was on our uh, discussions a few weeks ago uh, in his hospital setting uh, said, now's also the time to start adding that petition 
for the people who have recovered and are back home. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's a wonderful thing to think about also. It's not only those who are sick and those who watch over them, but in Thanksgiving for those who have been healed. My parish had some cases, happily, uh, those folks are uh, out of their extended hospital stay and are back. So um, once again, not necessarily naming people by name, of course, but uh, to acknowledge that um, some are getting better. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great insight. Yeah, typically, Michael, you use pastoral patterns in your church too, right? We use the pastoral patterns. Yeah. From, um, and it's actually a nice format if you don't know the book. Um, there's a very solid uh, intercessions for each week. And then I must admit there are some blank lines underneath where it's nice for us. Uh, right now, if you see my book, it says number five, COVID, number six, six in the dead, which appear in a separate page. So, um, um, yes, yeah, that, I think that's a very a, nice resource. It's a nice resource. It's a good starting place for people if they're trying, you know, to find at least like a a cadence or, you know, a length of how long this prayer should be that I'm writing for the first time about a virus that we're still dealing with. Um, but I was going to say, um, I think that uh, other good places to look online for some kind of um, intercession writing help or even homily help so we can make sure that we're keeping a really full uh, perspective about what this looks like from different people's points of view would be like the Pray Tell blog that's um, hosted up there by you, Matt, um, uh, by Anthony Ruff. Um, I think that's a really good place to get uh, some insights into how other people are experiencing what's happening around the, the country and really around the world. Um, but also it's a place where you can see people working it out with one another. Like you can see people questioning one another, answering one another, challenging really. You can see the, the real wrestling of a lot of this poll that I'm sure Wendy, you see lots of with lots of people who really want church open right now. And lots of people who really, really want us to not open up church right now. Um, so that's a good place to just kind of look for the um, the questions themselves, but also to see how people are working around finding a language for it. Um, I think that's a helpful place. Yeah. In addition yeah. to um, to the pastoral patterns that that you mentioned, Michael, there's also um, palabras pastorales in Spanish, which which is a similar resource, but also includes um, preaching and intercession tips. So there are resources like that out there. I I also think this is a great opportunity, especially if you're at a community where, um, especially maybe you're at a community that's sharing a pastor or in a cluster. Maybe only one of your communities is live streaming liturgies for that area. Um, to, to be as inclusive as possible, of course, in the intercessions? Are, are there ways that um, you can uh, help develop that sense of belonging and that sense of fluency of, of understanding? In, in other words, if I'm a high schooler who has, you know, a graduating senior and I am not with my friends and don't have those celebrations, is there something I can see of my experience and what we're praying for or families? I mean, there, there's, there's a way that in our universal prayers, we can represent the experience of a wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. and, and especially if we have only one live stream liturgy, especially if it's serving multiple communities, we just have to be that much more attentive to it as well. Yeah, I mean, and I think too that the in accessory prayer time, a, a chance for education again, um, it's not meant to be like the announcements for your parish, but to remind people that it, uh, this is a time when we unabashedly tell God all the things that we really want and we need. And um, I don't know if you know, it might be something to consider that while people are daring to come back into communal spaces again, to um, make these inclusive while also not making them too flowery or long. Because every, every time we extend the things that we need to say and do, we're extending people's exposure to one another. Um, so I think there, there's a lot to be done in, in just the, just the part of, uh, general intercessions. Yeah. You know, another thing to think about too would be, um, you know, kind of in, in a, in a pure form, the intercession is for the church. We pray for the church, you know, silently, and then we pray to the Lord. So especially as, you know, a lot of people have been talking about, um, kind of recapturing, if you had, don't, haven't captured it already, the value of silence in the liturgy. If you set up the intercessions by saying, um, this is going to be your time to offer, you know, in your heart silently 
all the prayers you have for, for the world and yourself. So for the church, we pause. We pray to the Lord. So again, that's, um, you know, it's a little bit of a sneaky way to build in less speaking in the liturgy, but also allow people to really actively participate in the liturgy, uh, not just by singing or saying, but by, by praying in their hearts. Look what we did just right here and how this can be done with a parish. If your community perhaps writes intercessions together, we just had a reminder of how to do this. We tell God what we need, what we want. We don't tell God how to do it. Uh, <laughs> and you know, those other principles. Um, one thing that's, that's a reality is many places maybe had mass intentions scheduled out uh, four or five on a weekend and there might be uh, a single streamed mass or maybe only one or two masses. Um, you know, are we remembering to include all of the mass intentions and whether or not the rules talk about how many stipends can be applied towards a mass? Uh, it's, a, it's a minor thing, it might seem, seem silly, but there's a way to make sure that uh, all those mass intentions are honored. So don't forget that. Um, for those of you who are joining us live, um, thanks to Laura, she posted a, uh, a list of intentions that based upon a, a Tizay litany that um, might, might also give you um, a, a jumping off point. So thanks, Laura, for, for sharing that with us. Um, moving to, from Liturgy of the Word to Liturgy of the Eucharist, I'm going to scroll our page here, so we're all looking at the same thing. Um, let's talk about these three. So first, we have the topic of um, gifts of bread and wine being brought from a credence table as opposed to being offered um, by members of the community, considering alternatives to passing the basket for collection, and then um, the, the sign of peace. So um, maybe let's start with that first bullet point in terms of gifts of bread and wine being brought to the altar from a credence table. Any insights or recommendations here? You know, I think that the suggestion given here that the gifts remain in the sanctuary and are brought simply to the altar like they would be for, you know, many daily masses. Again, the, the less hands on things, the better. Um, and, and again, we keep going back to this, but that educational point is so important that this isn't, um, this isn't the normal way we do it, but we're doing it this way out of concern for you, out of um, your sense of respecting life that, uh, you know, we're, we're keeping people as safe as possible, but still allowing the church to worship. Um, so I think, you know, omitting the gift procession, but again, doing education about it is, is a good idea in this case. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think also as we adjust these practices, how are we also able to, um, uh, keep the, the symbolism. I mean, is there a way that these can be brought from a credence table, but also in such a way that we're not losing the visual impact of them being offered? I think there's a, there's a way that, that something like that could happen. Um, what about passing the basket for the collection? <laughs> I know um, last time we had some questions that we weren't able to get to. Considering alternatives here, could the offerings be placed in a large basket near the sanctuary? Could long-handled collection plates be used and regularly cleaned? Could online donation services be utilized? You know, a lot of, there are certainly a lot of parishes that are hurting right now because of their loss of income. And I, I don't know if a lot of you saw, but there was an article going around about, surprisingly, there are a lot of parishes that are doing okay. And I think it, it's a lot of those parishes that are really um, leaning into their online donation services. I know at my husband's parish, uh, they use Give Central. And so there's a way that you can have an account um, that you can, make your donation during mass if you want to, or you can make it any other time of the week or of the month. Um, you can make special donations, one-time donations. You can make them regularly. You can make them automatic. They also have options at their church to text to give. So they just text that little five or six digit number. They're what they would like to, to give. And they, and they also encourage um, quick pay by Zelle or Zelly. Um, so that's just through your um, through your bank and through an email address. So they have an email address where they can uh, send send uh, funds. And it's not you know it's not a hundred percent, but they're able to keep up pretty pretty well by staying in contact with um, their parishioners throughout the week um, and providing a, 
uh, they, they live stream every liturgy so that parishioners can keep up with their regular schedule if they want to. If they're mm -hmm. usually an 11 o'clock mass goer, that's when they go. All these things that are kind of showing people somewhat of a, a, a regularness or a, what to expect, I think are having um, at least some luck getting people to engage in, in online giving. I think Matt mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the idea that we acknowledge those gifts and we we thank the assembly for those gifts. Um, you know, this isn't, you know, normally we wouldn't, um, you know, do a lot of explaining during mass or all these explanatory add-ins that, you know, it's not something that we typically recommend. But in this case, I mean, we're obviously way off the normal page. And so for the presider at the time of the offering of the gifts to say, you know, in Thanksgiving for all of you who have, you know, offered of your um, treasure in this in this extraordinary time for our benefit and for the benefit of those we serve throughout the world. Um, something. A lot of places are, are um, prohibiting the passing of the basket. Um, the long-handled basket seems like a possibility, but again, that's hands in the basket. It's so easy to touch anything. So at least at the beginning stages, the less touch, the better. So I think most places are putting baskets at the entryways. But again, we need to be explicit about, about their use that um, please drop your regular you know, collection in the basket at the door on your way out. Um, and thank you for those who are giving electronically. There's more information about electronic giving you know, in our bulletin and on our website, whatever it is. But yeah, I mean, it's a reality that we need to remind people that, that church life is going on and church life requires yeah. support. And yeah. one of the one of the things that I want to I want to mention too, just because we'll we'll be getting into some of this naturally with this topic um, here, but for Friday, our next conversation, our tenth conversation, um, two o'clock on Friday, we still have some spots open. We'll deal with um, fundraising, finances, development at this time. I mean, including including um, approaches uh, for how to do collections, but even even beyond that. Um, so so if that's something that's of particular interest to you, I, I recommend that you uh, join us for Friday or watch that uh, that recording after it's done you know one of the things we'll talk about there and, and even here like we're, we're as, assuming in all the things we're talking about that as we reopen with limited capacity that we're also continuing live streaming or televising our liturgies right so so even when we talk about at the moment of off, of, uh, of the offertory of, of acknowledging the people at home who have given because they've done text to give or um, have an ACH etc I mean we'll it's important that we're we're considering both of these realities in person and live streaming. It's also important for us to consider that not just at this time, but also beyond this, how is this the opportunity to strategize your virtual outreach to your community? I mean, when when you look at the majority of parishes have less than half, even more under 30% of an accuracy for email list, um, this is the time to improve that accuracy for outreach, not just now when we can't be together, but to, to further weather these things. So, so this is a, um, there's a short term need here, but there's also a longer term strategy this can feed into. Two, two things on this, please. Uh, Matt, I think you just mentioned this. In fact, and before our show today, we were talking about the oddity of, would we actually invite someone who's watching the liturgy during the stream at the moment of the offertory collection to take out their phone and make their electronic transfer at that very minute. Talk about a weird way of, you probably got your phone in your hand watching the liturgy anyway, so why not put it to use? <laughs> and then second, we need to talk about with our safety officers, how do we uh, safely open the envelopes? Um, is this going to be a couple days later, a couple hours later? But what are the precautions? for the money counters touching all the envelopes that have been dropped in by people. So uh, that's a whole nother issue. Right, right. We, um, a long, a long time, many weeks ago, actually, at the very beginning of this, I think it was maybe the first or second week of the quarantine, we did a, a short Facebook Live video talking about ideas for contributions, collections, et cetera. And one of the things we talked about there that, um, that has, has proven to be useful for a lot of places is also, I mean, in maybe not necessary for the, the collection during liturgy, but just in general, 
how can your community I, um, match the ask for donations to a specific need? A lot of people like to give to a particular need, give to a particular thing. So, I mean, there, there are so many elements here in terms of that invitation, how people can be invited to give, giving as many platforms as possible to facilitate that giving electronically, texting, writing a check, dropping it in the basket, whatever it might be. Um, we really kind of have to reach for it all at this point in time. And speaking of reaching, the third bullet point, um, handshakes exchange many germs. Uh, so doctors recommend that there's no physical contact during the sign of peace, nor the Lord's Prayer. Any um, advice, insight, what places are doing um, to, com to uh, maybe mark that sign of peace, but not to have a physical exchange for the sign of peace? You know, I've seen a couple different things. I think most places are just omitting it, especially in a live stream mass when there's no one to greet anyway. Um, they're just going straight into um, the Lamb of God. I've also, I think, um, I've been helping with a live stream at, at a parish that I sometimes um, serve with. And uh, they say something to the effect of, um, because they're speaking to an audience, or audience, ah, an assembly at home, um, please exchange a sign of peace with those around you in your home. And they're just really clear about that. Which, you know, if you're domiciled together, you can exchange a sign of peace. Um, and then, you know, once we start going back to, and in parts of the country that already are, uh, what do we do at that moment? Um, rather than skipping it, um, you know, some people have, you know, suggested a, another kind of a gesture. Um, you know, holding hands during the Lord's Prayer is obviously out, and there's some assemblies that are going to need instruction on that because it's so much a part of their ritual pattern. Of course, we know it's not an official part of the liturgy, but it's a part of our, our common, um, common way of worshiping. So anything like that, and I think... Uh, the last big liturgy that we had here in Chicago was the rite of election. And when everyone came forward to greet the bishop, it was March 8th, um, rather than shaking hands, he did elbow bumps with everyone. <laughs> um, so it was kind of cute. It was acknowledging that, you know, we're in a different kind of a, a, a time, but you know, what's the point of the sign of peace? It's to reconcile with one another before we receive the Eucharist. Um, so what other sign of reconciliation can we offer? Whether it's a smile, a nod, um, just, um, you know, take a moment to express your gratitude for the other members of the community here worshiping with you, you know, ask, ask for forgiveness for anyone that you may have wronged here, you know, something like that with, you know, acknowledging that the sign of peace is, is a moment that is a ritual moment, but we can't use our typical ritual gesture. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, a lot of great comments have just come in in the comments about, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, ASL, a wave, uh, people are getting good at nodding, some are putting their hands together and bowing, so people are finding new ways to do the sign of peace. And um, I want to single out uh, Carol's comment here, um, and I think there's something uh, what we've been hinting at. Uh, people in the, in, through uh, regular media, they're starting to understand the COVID rules. That's been a teaching moment for them. And now the same thing, let's use this not only to give people the rules of what we're going to do in liturgy, but as we said before, the catechesis and the understanding about what uh, these elements of the liturgy are. So um, a good teaching moment as we're also teaching um, how to do things. We can also teach theology. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and just going back one tiny step to, um, for music to the Liturgy of the Eucharist, Michael hinted at this, but the idea of using some call and response or, you know, forms that we might typically not use for some of our ritual music. Um, there's the beautiful Richard Prue, holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord of all I forgot how we sing the song. <laughs> um, but sing the correct words and then the cantor gestures are not sung back in places where our congregational singing is allowed. Again, if you don't have something in your hands, what's the most familiar thing you can do that people sing by heart? Most people don't use a worship aid for acclamations anyway. But, you know, acclamations that are call and response and other parts of the liturgy that are call and response. Just continually thinking as we go through all of, all of the liturgy, how can we best facilitate good liturgical practice but also safe liturgical practice? Um, all right, so communion rights. So we're moving along here on page 10. Um, now, a couple of things. There's a lot of information that's here. As we mentioned, 
This conversation today is part two of last Friday's conversation. And before that last Wednesday, it's hard to believe that that was a week ago. It seems like it was so much longer ago. Um, we welcomed uh, Rita Thyron, executive director of the FDLC, who put together these guidelines, and Monsignor Rick Hillgardner, former um, director of the Secretariat of Divine Worship at the USCCB. And in that conversation, we talked a lot more specifically about this section. So I encourage you to go back to that conversation also. But here as we look at the communion rite, um, what kind of things do we want to make sure that we touch on today or we want to make sure to emphasize in, in our part two conversation now? How about with the Chicago guidelines, Wendy? I mean, when, as you're looking in the Archdiocese of Chicago, what are the approaches? I know that this one is so difficult because not only is it the, the distancing and the distributing and the contact, but then also we get into the, the manner in which people receive. And so it, it, it's, it's difficult in a practical sense and then also difficult in a, in a, in a, a personal sense, um, how Chicago approaching this. Yeah, you know, I think it's really important, you know, going back to Michael's idea of having a really accurate map of your church. Um, here in Chicago, we are saying um, one center procession line for the reception of the Eucharist. And of course, it's only in the form of um, the consecrated body of Christ. We're not receiving the blood of Christ right now. Um, in churches that don't really have a center aisle, how are you going to manage that? And how are you going to manage ministers? Does that mean, you know, and again, you know, eliminating the amount of touch we can do. So we don't want 10 Eucharistic ministers up there with cross contamination and just all kinds of possibilities open up. So does the priest go from aisle to aisle, depending on the numbers of your assembly? Um, do you have a deacon? How, how is that going to be accomplished? Um, I think it's important that whatever aisles are used are marked off in six foot increments. And just like you do at the grocery store, you stand on your X until the next is, av next X is available, then you move up one spot. Um, so you just have to manage that. And I was thinking about that six foot bubble around people. So it's not just in front of you, but it's to the sides of I think the airline behind you, you know, the nearest exit may be behind you. Um, so you need to think about yourself in a three dimensional space and in your own unique space. Here in Chicago, what we're um, having people do is come forward. And again, we're talking assemblies of 10 or less at this point. So it's, it's pretty manageable. Um, the, there's a table of hand sanitizer. You sanitize your hands, you're wearing a mask. At this point, the priest, and we're requiring this in Chicago, has on a face shield. Anytime one of our presiders comes into any kind of intimate contact with people um, without a mask, a baptism, wedding, you know, you're close to the wedding couple, we're requiring a face shield or a mask and goggles, but I think most guys are going to opt for a clear shield. Um, so you come forward, you sanitize your hands, you step in front of the person distributing communion in their face shield, uh, you pull down. You, you receive the Eucharist, you step six feet off to the side where there's an X, you pull down one side of your mask, you receive the Eucharist, and of course we're talking only in the hand at this point, and then you replace your mask and go back to your pew. So that's how we've worked it out here. It's kind of based on some of those guidelines that went around nationally to the bishop. Um, one of the suggestions Montini Rick made, which I thought made a lot of sense, is have a small table in front of the person distributing with hand sanitizer on it so that um, the hand sanitizer is available, and if the priest or the distributor of communion inadvertently touches someone, they can place the ciborium down, sanitize their hands, pick it back up again very easily. So um, it's a huge consideration, um, especially when we're requiring masks in a building, how do we unmask to receive? I think this was this was a point that was pretty clear to a lot of people before the document, but just in case the the, the communion rite is an unmovable element of the order of mass. So uh, I think when this was first starting to happen, people were suggesting like maybe we could just do communion at the end and then people can just take it and and walk out. Um, but the the keeping the integrity of the order of mass um, is still possible <laughs> and and is still worth it. So make sure that we're not messing with that because <laughs> that's definitely not allowed. But we've had a couple of questions about um, distributing um, by going out to the pews instead of asking people to um, process. Um, and I don't know what people are doing in their own uh, in their own diocese, but I would think that that would be a, a recommendation made by people's individual diocese. Is that right, Wendy? You know, I think it really, again, depends on the map of your church. If you've got widely spaced pews, or if you're in a situation where you don't have pews and you have chairs, you could set this up easily. 
-hmm. so that um, the chairs are set far enough apart. And then, um, you know, that, that makes it harder for family units to sit together. So there's pros and cons of everything, but yeah. that would make it easier. Um, you know, any of us that have tried to shuffle sideways through a pew knows that um, it's, it's easy to get that wrong and trip over a kneeler or something like that. The last thing you want to do is have hosts spilling all over. So I'd just be careful with that. And it really depends on the configuration of your church. I think a single line moving forward with social distancing to a minister who has already sanitized their hands and is staying in place and is safe with the hosts, um, to me makes the most sense. But again, it really depends on local guidelines and local wisdom. And another example here, what can we do for our congregations? We need to give them rules about how we're going to do this and roadmaps, but also a wonderful time to catechize. As we listen to some of these things being put forward uh, by some dioceses, are we confusing the celebration of the Eucharist with the reception of communion? Uh, one archdiocesan guideline suggested that only the priest would receive at that mass. You're all welcome to come in your cars for this outdoor mass, but only the priest receives and the rest of you make a spiritual communion. Or only the priest receives, he will consecrate extra hosts, and then for a half hour after that mass, he'll be outside to distrib distribute communion, um, where we're confusing the celebration of the Eucharist with reception of communion mm -hmm. and what a good time to catechize people about what yeah. the difference is. Mm -hmm. um, once again, uh, we've said these words and uh, they might appear in some places. I don't think they're going to appear in Chicago, Wendy, but uh, does this constitute a time when the uh, Sunday celebration in the absence of a priest may be uh, suitable to be employed? But um, that's strain, but once again, catechesis, the difference between attending mass and receiving communion, two different things. Yeah. You know, one of the most interesting places to um, get a little insight about how this is hitting people so vastly differently around the, the nation and the world is Twitter. And I find Catholic Twitter to be particularly just it's fascinating because even though like I get to see lots of different churches and lots of different communities all around the country as a, um, a function of my job, um, I, I still find people that I'm just like, wow, I can't believe that. Um, <laughs> well, somebody made a comment the other day, if the priest thinks I'm going to receive communions in my hand or communion in my hands, um, he's got another thing coming. <laughs> I, I was like, wow, um, I didn't, I didn't realize that, but I see Siobhan here makes a comment, much like I don't feel obligated to go shop, shopping, et cetera, when the quarantine orders are lifted. I don't know if I'll feel obligated to receive communion when we begin celebrating public masses again. And so I just wanted to take this um, a minute to not forget to remind people that not everybody who attends mass receives communion um, for reasons that they decide or for other you know reasons that have been um, determined by their um, community and maybe their communities not um, offering mass uh, live mass yet it's only virtual um, and uh, we're still uh, we have a dispensation still from that obligation to uh, receive communion and so we should really use we should use our best discretion about what's most appropriate and what will keep ourselves and um, the rest of our community safe yeah. One of the um, one of the other uh, comments that was was mentioned that I want to make sure to or two comments um, similar that were mentioned is we're talking also some communities are making sort of little instructional videos how to return back to demonstrate procedures to help explain to people which I think is I think is great because people can receive that information and that information whenever it is they get to it but also it's familiar faces familiar. <laughs> If, if depending on how you are having people um, sign up or reserve spots or however you're doing crowd control for the number of spaces you have available, you have something to send to people to watch ahead of time. Um, but those are opportunities, not just for the practicalities of where do I sit and how will I receive communion and how will I go back. It's also an opportunity for that category to explain these other things, to, to initiate those other conversations. So um, Ken uh, and Laura and some others made comments about videos. I think a, a 
one of our previous conversations, I mentioned, um, I think it's St. Thomas Aquinas in uh, Texas has uh, a couple of video examples up of um, that they've put out to people for in advance of them reopening. It might be something to consider and to add that extra layer of, um, of catechizing. Um, oh, go ahead. I was say, I, I also, I know our time is running short. I, I did see a, a few uh, questions here. Um, and uh, once again, these bear repeating, there was a question about, uh, is the congregation wearing masks at all times? In many dioceses, yes, that is the case uh, for singing, uh, if there is singing, uh, for speaking. So once again, under the spirit of diocese by diocese, the norms are set, but that seems to be uh, common. Um, I think we talked about uh, going to the pews for communion. And then another question about how do we help those who are vulnerable and can't attend mass to feel connected to the liturgy beside live streaming? Um, we can't be doing communion visits to the sick, um, but that, 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 that almost be an entire show in itself uh, with a pastoral care team talking about how can we respond to people who maybe don't want, who want more than just communion. They want interaction with the human being. And um, uh, that's gonna be tough for a while, yeah. Sorry, Carol, not a good answer on that one. You know, and I think in a lot of cases, um, you know, we need to think about how we're exercising pastoral care right now. And it might mean a lot of phone calls. There's so many places out there that have divided up their parish registry and they're just calling everybody because not everybody has a phone not a, or, you know, a, a cell phone or a smartphone or a computer or whatever um, to just make sure that nobody is being um, forgotten in this time. Um, the, a lot of parishes have organized um, grocery drop-offs and, you know, supply drop-offs for their vulnerable population. So, you know, I think it really goes to um, pastoral care. We can't invite them probably to, to a live liturgy for a while but how else can we care for their needs? And I know that um, not being able to offer communion to the homebound is a, real, um, is a real struggle and sacrifice for people. So how else can we stay connected? And I think in this case, it really needs to be voice-to-voice um, -voice communication and, and can I pray with you? In Chicago, we've got a couple of things available. One's a, a prayer line. You can just call in and pray with somebody. Um, English, Spanish, and Polish, those are our main language groups here. Uh, we've also just started online bereavement groups. We know that there's so many people at home that are mourning a loss, um, and it doesn't have to be COVID related. I mean, loss is a part of our lives all the time. And now it's so hard to grieve because we can't grieve with others. Um, so what can you know your parish do? What's your dio diocese offering to continually connect people back to the, the vine? <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say too, just about the, um, the communion, right? If your community or your diocese is one that has um, elected to forego singing in the, uh, in-person liturgies for now, um, that doesn't mean that you have to forego music. Whether you've determined that instrumental music is most appropriate for you, or perhaps for this particular set of circumstances, um, recorded music is the best or only option for your community. Think of it too as, you know, if you're putting together a, a worship aid anyway, why not give a little bit of information about the melodies that they're hearing so that people don't have to wonder. <laughs> They may recognize that as a communion song, we talk a little bit, give them a little bit of information about um, where that particular chant comes from and, and how it's, you know, has made an appearance in a variety of ways throughout history and um, help them to feel connected, not just, you know, with the, in the ways that we can be in a limited way connected now, but connected also to our ancestors and history. And this is, this is just, it's a certain part of time in a long, long, um, and a long, long conversation. And this is uh, making the best of what we can with what's Yeah, and in, in addition, you know, no, no singing also doesn't mean that we can't provide, you know, those, those hymn texts or something that, that are gonna be meaningful that not only can I, I have there to pray with even individually, but also have throughout the week as a, just another touchstone back to that experience, I think would be great. Um, one of our local parishes here picked an odd time of day, 1.23, in the afternoon, not in the morning. And at 1.23, for two minutes, they just ring the bells to let everyone know who's hearing them, you know, because everyone will look at their watch and they wonder why the bells are broken, but <laughs> they ring them at a weird time to, to just as a, a audio touchstone to say, we're thinking about you, we're praying about you, 
you know, and everyone who within hearing distance, you know, has that different connection. So there are a variety of, of things to do here. Um, with our limited time we have left, um, so so one one final thing about communion right again in the FDLC guidelines, there's all kinds of things to explore here. As Wendy's mentioned, again, look at your local diocesan guidelines because of course there are going to be more specifics there. There are other uh, pieces of information here from the germ and other places. And then finally, we get to the concluding right. And I think, um, you know, maybe that last bullet point is the one in particular procedurally that we have to think about, which is how do we have people leave um, so that we avoid the bottleneck? People arrive at different times, maybe, but we're all going to leave at the same time. So do we dismiss people in an orderly fashion? Do we dismiss them through the same door, through separate doors? Do we prop the doors? Uh, there are all kinds of considerations here, too, for us to think about and talk about. I think it's good, too, to think about um, your music area. If you're um, uh, you know, expanding your music ministry a bit as, as these days go by, it's so natural for us musicians after liturgy to kind of collapse upon one another. And, you know, we all start grabbing stuff and putting stuff away and being helpful. We have to be really careful about that. Again, minimal touch on um, shared surfaces. Um, how do we, you know, make sure that when we're leaving, we're dispersing with six feet bubbles around us as well. Um, just to, to keep in mind that we need to think about, does, it's not selfish. We need to think about ourselves as well as our assemblies. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, uh, we, we are, we are at, at the end of our time here, um, once again, faster than, than we anticipated. Um, just a couple of, of reminders. These, these guidelines are part of the document from the Federation of Diocesan Liturgical Commissions. You can download them at fdlc.org slash COVID. You can find your diocesan guidelines on your diocesan website. I am sure that they're posted there, or FDLC also has a collection of diocesan guidelines. You know, and just point. a note about Chicago, because I was yeah. trying to look it up and it's it's not as clear as it could be um but if you go to archchicago.org and you go under news and events Perfect. that's the tab and then under that you can just kind of keep weaving your way down into our covid resources Wonderful. Um, so, so many, if not all of these are available in a way that you can access them now to get ideas. Please continue to, to talk to one another. One of, the, one of the reasons that we do conversations like this is, you know, we, we might have some ideas, but it's as much to connect those of you who are doing this and seeing things to one another. Um, please consider joining us for a future conversation. Again, this Friday, our 10th conversation is all about fundraising, development, stewardship, how, how can parishes, schools, and faith communities um, continue this work in the short term, in the long term? How, how is this actually presenting opportunities that maybe didn't exist before? So please, um, please take a look. Thank you, Kate, Michael, Wendy, as always, for, for joining us and for sharing your wisdom. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us. Please continue to be safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you again at another Homecoming Sunday conversation. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank Bye, everybody. You. Thank you.